My name is Luke Titus. I was born in 1941 at the Tannen Hospital. And um, at that time, they uh, did not have any kind of transportation. So my mom brought me back to Minto on the steamboat. One of the memories I have of old Minto uh, as a child is that we moved around a lot with the season. In the summertime, we moved to the river for the salmon. The wintertime, we moved off the Minto flat for the trapping. And a lot of that was uh, a nomadic lifestyle for us. We had chores to do every day growing up. We had to help the elders with their wood, make sure they had wood and water at their houses. So we visit them a lot. And some of the elders would pay us with a pilot bread cracker. And if we were really fortunate, we would get uh, butter on there or lard or jam on there for us. And that was really a treat at that time. One of the first things I remember about candy is that uh, they had a licorice and there was just one kind of candy and that was black. And uh, later on there came gum, which was, uh, I don't know how to say, but it was, that, it was not a very good taste to it. It was called blackjack gum. And uh, we just eat it because it was different. And then when sugar was the staple food, maybe you sprinkle a little on our pancake. We had sourdough pancake all the time. And then reach over to my mom or my dad's cup, coffee cup, and sprinkle some on that sugar. That was our syrup for the day. Each family had their own trail out to their trap line and um, wood that was used in the home was um, brought in by dog team. And we had hand saw that we used, no chainsaw those days. Uh, one of those uh, times it was um, record cold weather for 60 below for one week. And we ran out of wood at our house. My dad said, we're going out for wood. And uh, it was so cold, I remember that day. Uh, we had to drag the dogs out of the house to get them into harness. And once we got moving, we couldn't stop. Everything was kind of in a slow motion. I heard that uh, the runners sliding in the cold weather, it made Drain sound. We got back to the wood yard, we loaded on the wood, and then and we immediately we, we um, let the dogs out of their harness and they just made beeline to their dog houses. It was so cold that they uh, just, I'll never forget that. You're taught to survive the cold weather. You're taught to survive food and all these things, uh, living in a close-knit family, how you resolve your issues with each other. It was just common to take care of each other and that element. Before we went out into the play, uh, we'd look at each other and make sure that we had mittens and everything was on properly. The whole village was the nucleus of our livelihood. Like the grandparents, they became the grandparents for all the children. So same applies to the uncles and aunties. So it, across the village, uh, it was everybody involved. I remember walking down the street past an elder and he would be walking with his cane. He had a, a lawn stick and I knew immediately that uh, this person was going to say something to me. 
and it would be like advice or something to apply in uh, in our daily life. He would say it to us, and when when he was done, he put that stick on our shoulder, lay that stick on our shoulder. He say, "Don't forget what I tell you." When I first went to school at Old Minto, they said it was time to eat, and so all the kids got up and had something to eat. I don't know where this vegetable came from. I, I, it must be a commodity food from uh, shipped into Minto. I'm not sure, but uh, we couldn't eat it. It was uh, I don't know what it was, asparagus. I don't remember, but. Nobody ate it, and uh, it was just strange to to see that kind of food in our diet, and uh, it was just uh, something I always remembered that uh, food coming into the village. I think the teaching system was really hard for the teachers to teach all all the grades in one room. Now that's just my concept of what, uh, why we were sent away. The first boarding school I went to was in Wrangell Institute. It was uh, quite an experience. I, I never saw electric lights before. I never saw running water and um, have your own bed. It was a bad experience. What the things that took place, I cannot talk about those. But uh, the transition from village life, all of a sudden in a big dormitory with a lot of other tribes, they had little children in there. So when we go to bed at night, these kids would be crying, and they would really cry hard. You could tell them you can't get up to help them. And it was, uh, you can't do that. It was, they punished us for that, and it was just, I can't say how much it really taught me to hear those crying, wailing of uh, those kids I missed their home. The other was that they did not uh, allow us to talk our language, and um, that was uh, traumatic for me. I was uh, caught one time singing a native song, and I, uh, even to this day, it really affected me because um, the way that they walked me through the punishment, I, I, I uh, uh, when I walked away from that school, I told myself I'm never going to talk my language and sing my native song again. If life is going to be like this, I'm just going to give up. And it was too traumatic. Coming out of that situation, going to another boarding school and being abused by one of the teachers, that, that was another thing that really caused me to drink. I think when I came out of high school, I, I just I, I just turned into an alcoholic and I just really had a rough time after high school. My dad was an alcoholic and I was always scared of him. I was always... Um, it wasn't a good experience. My mom, dad, they told me that uh, they both got saved. They both got went to church, and they both got delivered from what the lifestyle they had. They stayed sober. If something happened to them, I knew that. You know, they had a spiritual experience. 
My dad was a subsistence hunter, so I learned a lot of the hunting skills from him to live off the land, uh, take care of animals, take care of things that we catch. In 1970, we moved from Old Minto to here. I got a notice that uh, there was an opening at um, school out in Arizona, and this was a through the Episcopal Church. So I went out to my boss that night. I was working for BLM on a cadastral survey crew. He said, um, you always have a job when you come back to Alaska. Say, uh, I'll leave a spot open for you. But after three years there, I was um, inspired and began to take interest in being ordained a minister, priest. So, and at the same time, something happened I never expected. I met a lady there from Navajo Reservation and uh, fell in love with her. And here's someone that I like to be with the rest of my life. It's kind of overwhelming experience to, to see someone that uh, walk into my life and will be a part of my life was not long that after that that we got married. We stayed out there a couple of years and she decided to move back to Alaska and stay up, make her home up there. So she she just lived up there with me. You know, so. Coming back was um, really um, not having too much in plan for my future. I just kind of wandering all over the place. And I was still uh, involved in alcohol and drugs. I was so sick in Anchorage that a um, friend came to help me. I was in the hotel room, uh, blood all over. They just um, uh, asked me what happened. I, um, I don't know, something came loose inside me and just bleeding all over my nose and mouth. And, and um, he rushed me over to the hospital and sat down with the doctor there. He talked to me. And, he told me in 1985, he said, um, he said, Luke, you're just killing yourself with alcohol. And that was uh, 25 years of drinking. And uh, he said, you could do two things. He said, you could quit, live longer, but if you keep on drinking, he said, Lord knows how long you'll live. I started to cry, I started, started, started to, I couldn't hold myself back and tell them, Doc, I want to quit drinking. But, um, I got up out of that chair, February 5, 1985, walked out of the doctor's office, never to take a drink again. A lot of miracles happened in that process. A lot of things happened when I did that. It was just really amazing how simple step can change your life. I <clears throat> I came back to Minto. I was very ashamed. First thing I thought about coming back to Minto from Anchorage that on that trip was to think, what will my people say when they find out that their priest is an alcoholic? What will they think of me? I was very ashamed. I didn't want to go out of the house.
One of the first things I did was to join uh, Alcoholics Anonymous. So from here I call their 800 number. They say, can we help you? I tell them, yeah, I tell them I'm out in the village. I'm about ready to travel to Anchorage. My old plans are kicking in. So how do I cope with that? So they had somebody meet me in Fairbanks. This guy took me to the airport and he said, will you be okay when you get inside the terminal? And I looked at him and I said, I don't know. I said, right at the top of the steps is a bar before you get on the airplane. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, I'll walk with you. He said, took me out to the waiting room, stayed with me till the plane come. And he said, will you be okay when you get to Anchorage? And again, I looked at them, I said, I don't know, they also have a bar there in Anchorage. He said, wait a minute, he said, I'll give you a number. Call this guy, he said, good thing he did, because when, uh, when he did that, uh, this guy was waiting for me in Anchorage. And I just couldn't get over how these guys were helping me along with my sobriety. Sebastian Cowboy from St. Mary's became my good friend. And we've been helping each other ever since we walked that sobriety trail together. So in sobering up, there's options for people. You just need to be able to utilize them and make good use of it. I was um, able to, to work at old mental recovery camp in almost 18 years and retired a couple of years ago. No matter who you are, if you're an alcoholic or drug addict, no matter what kind of person you are, you can be redeemed from that type of life. So I was able to to work in different churches in Fairbanks area, Minto, and all the native villages. I make my stand to help people in a spiritual way. I got punished for singing native song. And like I said, I walked away from that experience promising myself I'll never sing or dance native again. I uh, noticed a drum on his shelf. My dad just passed away and he left his drum. And uh, I picked up that drum and I started to Hit it. Very overwhelming experience to, for me. I stand up and I start to sing. I say, Nobody's stopping me. Nobody's making punishing me. I could sing all I want. There's something inside me that nobody will ever take away from me. And when I was singing, it came out. That flame inside me kind of came out, start singing, start talking my language, start drumming again. And to this day, I teach my children, I teach my grandchildren how to sing and dance. And I dance with my people. 
with that and newness of life to, to our culture.